the Community Oversight Board to order. I'll start with the reading of the appeal statement pursuant to the provisions of Section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final de decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. Um, I'm going to do a roll call to see who we have present here. I think we may have all board members present. Uh, I'll start with uh, Mr. Jamel Cam Kamalgooch, are you here? I don't think he's here yet. Ms. Ross? Present. And Mr. Sweeney? Present. Okay. Um, with that, I will move on to Mr. Pinkley for the electronic meeting statement. Thank you. Uh, so as we've done with all of our other meetings, I'll give a, a brief history of how we got here, and then we'll just need a motion in a second. Uh, so back in March, uh, Governor Lee issued Executive Order 16. Uh, that order granted or suspended the in-person requirements for quorum for meetings. Uh, that order has since been extended by Executive Orders 34 and 51 and now 60, uh, which is set to expire October 28th. So essentially all we need is to uh, have a motion stating that we are meeting electronically to conduct essential business and to protect the safety and welfare of Tennesseans. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Pinkley, and thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Uh, any focused discussion? Nope. With that, uh, I guess I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, everyone, for being late. Um, but I'm not sure what I'm uh, naming is on the floor. Yes, uh, we're just voting on the electric electronic meeting statement. Yes, okay. I vote aye. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Aye. And Mr. Sweeney. Aye. Okay, thank you. So I will move along to the approval of the minutes. If everyone's had a chance to review them, uh, do I have a motion to approve those? I'll, I'll move to approve. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Kamal Gooch. Um, any focused discuss discussion on the minutes? Anything that needed to be changed? Uh, if there's nothing, we'll go through uh, another roll call vote to approve them. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. And Mr. Sweeney. Aye. Okay, with the minutes uh, being approved, we'll go on to the sixth agenda item that uh, I wanted to include here. So I wanted to remind the members of the community who may be listening in right now that there's a new COB executive committee that was elected two weeks ago. Um, so we have Mr. Campbell Gooch serving as first vice chair, Ms. Brenda Ross serving as second vice chair, and Mr. Matt Sweeney serving as secretary again. Um, and then I wanted to take some time to, to update you on the steps I've taken so far as the new chair to ensure that there's a smooth transition. So over the past two weeks, I've had several conversations with Executive Director Fitchard to discuss current MNCO priorities, current COB priorities, uh, next steps and strategies to ensure the COB continues progressing toward this new memorandum of understanding with MNPD that will guarantee that MNCO receive all necessary records to conduct its investigations. Uh, I'm grateful for her leadership here and I'm very much looking forward to working together with her throughout the next year. I participated in the second community town hall meeting hosted by the Metro Human Relations Commission. 
there uh, we opened a space for victims, rights advocates, survivors of domestic violence uh, or trafficking and mental health communities to articulate the qualities that they want to see in a new police chief and the vision that they have for uh, public safety in our community. I know there were some technical technical difficulties if you were listening in, I'm sure you heard them, um, but we were still able to hear from uh, over 30 community members by telephone or recorded message or email. I, I think there was a good mix of voices. I was heartened to hear that uh, there were representatives and directors from other organizations and agencies who called in, uh, including the Legal Aid Society, the Sexual Assault Center, the Office of Family Safety and the YWCA. Uh, I know Director Fitchard will speak a bit later about the improvements that we're hopefully making to address some of the technical issues that we've been having. I've also met with Mr. John Bunton, the mayor's policy director, to continue the relationship between the COB and the mayor's office. I reiterated to Mr. Bunton that our objective remains the same regarding the ongoing uh, dispute about records, that MNCO should have the same access as OPA. Uh, Director Fitchard has been following up with members of the MOU task force, which includes Mr. Bunton, Interim Chief Drake, Metro Le Legal Director Bob Cooper, and COB member Dr. Hildreth to set up a time to uh, come to the table to meet about and agree upon the new mender, uh, memorandum of understanding. I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that they will find a time to meet next week uh, so we won't let this drag on any any longer. Uh, MNPD and the mayor's office should be prioritizing this task force meeting and we'll continue pressing for it. And Director Fitchard will give a more in-depth update on this and another meeting that also included the district attorney's office. Um, next week, I've been invited to the Metro Council's LGBT caucus meeting to speak about issues the COB is facing. I took the uh, opportunity brought on by that invitation to engage council member Council Member Van Rees on the issue of diversity and representation on the Policing Policy Commission, especially pertaining to representation for members of the trans community that uh, our former chair, Ms. Davis, brought up at the, our last meeting. Um, she and Ms. Davis and Dr. Villier will speak a little bit more about uh, their updates from the Policing, Pol Policing Policy Commission uh, shortly as well. I know the transition may have seemed a bit abrupt two weeks ago, but I just want to make sure that uh, you guys know that I'm, I'm doing the best I can to uh, ensure continuity here. And if you have any suggestions for this process for me, please let me know. And I'm happy to answer any questions uh, now before moving on to the next agenda item. If no one has any questions, um, if Ms. Davis is with us, we can move on to the Policing Policy Commission. Thank you, Chair Martinez. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, Chair Martinez, do you have any opening statements there or do you want me to just jump right in with an update? I think uh, you, it's, a, it's fine if you jump right in with the update. Great. Okay. Thank you. So I um, want to be as thorough as possible, succinct as well. And I apologize that I can't stay for the duration of the meeting today, but um, I want to give an uh, update and just an overview of the meetings that have taken place as it relates to the uh, police uh, commission, uh, the mayor's police commission. So the committee that I'm on is the policy committee. Um, there are three committees, um, one focused on um, communities. The second is on um, services and engagement, and the third is policy. And that policy umbrella is rather large. It does cover training. It covers uh, whether or not there's any standardization in our current um, our current format. It also looks at de-escalation and use of force, which is of course a very pivotal and important component of the uh, eight can't wait. Um, that that kind of was a catalyst of all of this space. Um, the there are, and we all know this about 
40 plus people in total on the commission. So on the policy committee, there's about 14 to 15 people. Um, I was um, nominated and voted um, um, somewhat almost unanimously to be chair of that policy committee. What that entails, and I'm alongside Vice Chair Amanda Lucas in that space. That happened during our first meeting, which was about three weeks ago, um, shortly after our last COB meeting. Since that, that, that time and conversation, I just want to lay out for the executive committee how many of the meetings, the three meetings have taken place. The first one was um, much of the, the bulk of the conversation in the first meeting was around um, getting to know everyone um, and what priorities were uh, top of mind for everyone. Um, we also did the um, the voting of the, the chair uh, and vice chair. And there was also conversation around what the priorities of the policy committee would be. Would we stay centered on de-escalation or use of force rather and de-escalation or were there other um, points that need to be raised as well? Um, we had a very um, lengthy conversation in a good way around everyone's uh, stated priorities. And there was a very clear resounding um, uh, thread of there needing to be a very intentional language and recommendations around improved relationships, uh, relationship between the COB and MMPD. In fact, um, many, I would say out of the 14 members, and I'll take myself out, so 13, um, nearly nine out of the 10, 10 people um, said that it, success for them looks like a policy that reads and directs M MMPD to work collaboratively and continuously with COB early and often. Um, and I was very excited to hear that, but I'll be honest with you, I spoke at the end because once I was uh, you know, designated chair, I just felt it was most appropriate that I not leave with my comments. But I did state very clearly that the COB is very concerned um, about ensuring the insurance that we won't have to go back to the drawing board every time we make meaningful progress, um, that data records, training, other things that come out of MEPD, be that cadets or otherwise, that we are um, a part of this early and often and that our executive director is readily informed so that she can then inform and engage her staff and the board as well. From that conversation, um, much of that, that that first part of the dialogue was led by uh, John Button of the first meeting, uh, simply because we did not have direction before then. And then I took over once uh, they uh, named me chair. Um, there's also um, a woman by the name of Dia Sorello, who has been uh, quite instrumental in the um, in, in kind of the direction of the policy committee. She is an expert, not just in mental health and engagement, but also has been taking a very critical look and, and, and thorough look rather across the nation at best practices. And she's been uh, quite an indispensable resource to us, um, whether that's uh, an opinion we agree with right away or dissenting opinion that the committee takes away and tries to figure out how they want to um, um, reshape it for the best use of the, the Nashville community. Let me just jump to, to week two quickly and, and share with you. We had week two on September 3rd. Um, it's always on Thursday, starting at 6 p.m., uh, wrapping at 8, but sometimes we run over because it's just a lot to cover. Between the first and the second meeting, we got something called a level set packet. In this level set packet, there was um, a, a tremendous amount of information. We had U.S. Census information related to Tennessee um, and the, uh, the the Constitution of our people and those that are incarcerated, housing, families, economy, work as well. We also had a use of force training Q and question and answer that was given to us um, that on behalf of MMPD. Um, that was given to us by um, uh, Lieutenant Schmitz and Sergeant Barnes, as well as Officer. Herrera, um, and they answered questions of like how to answer officers train on the use of force and de-escalation. Um, is there training on critical decision-making process? Um, what type of forms are filled out? How is that escalated up? Many other things as well. And I don't believe there would be any reason why I should be able to share this out. But I, I do just want to make the, the, the group, the executive committee aware that while look in, in total, this, this, these, these packets probably total almost a hundred pages when you put the 
36, the 20, and then the 15 together. It's almost that much. But it's, it's chock full of a lot of information. The question then, as we all started to get into the information, is how accurate is all of this information? And that's where the rubber hit the road at the end of the last uh, meeting and between week two and where we are right now is week three. Many, many board members have, uh, many commit commission members and policy committee uh, members have expressed concern about the data in these levels, in this level set packet. Um, one professional in the uh, committee said very blatantly that the numbers just didn't add up and he wanted to understand why. Um, as I was leading the meeting, I couldn't there then read through the data. And like I said, we didn't get it until Thursday, I believe it's Thursday morning for a Thursday evening meeting. So we didn't have time to look through this data. But since then we have, and the concerns have been raised um, with John Button, with the mayor, uh, to share with the mayor. And the response now is that one, they've gone back to MMPD to request and understand why and what is going on with this data. And now they've also established a data committee to review this information and determine where, what, and, and if so, why there are discrepancies in these numbers. My understanding by email is that Dr. Belier has joined this committee as well. So the COB will be represented in that capacity. Tomorrow night, I'll lead the committee in determining who from the commission um, will join that as well from the policy committee as well. Um, I know from COB times, we care a lot about the data because it tells a story. I can tell you, no matter how this is sliced, it's very clear, and we knew this already, that people of color are disproportionately uh, impacted and uh, use of force is absolutely used at, a, at an alarming rate as it relates along racial lines. Um, we also push back as a committee because there was an interest on MMPD's point uh, part not to get into the quote weeds and talk about the racial disparities as it relates to use of force but we can't do our this job appropriately or credibly if we don't talk about race because it does play a very tremendous role here and so i have added that to next to tomorrow's um agenda it will now be an established component of the recommendations at first it was not um, and the last piece I'll just share here, and then I'll pause here for questions because I know I've said a lot, is instead of being focused on use of force, and I believe this came up in one of our COB meetings, the focus needs to be de-escalation. We need to look at the training that our cadets and also current officers and others commissioned officers have as it relates to de-escalation and not the primary focus being use of force. Yes, we need to know the numbers and the story, but first and foremost, we need to make sure that officers are pursuing de-escalation before they ever go towards use of force, unless, of course, they're in imminent danger. And much of the testimony we got on um, last week from Captain Blair, Lieutenant Schmitz, and Lieutenant uh, Dupuy, it, it, it gives us a lot of reason to be hopeful that there's been progress but it's clear to me that the pie is still heavily focused on um, tactics that require force, even if minimal, and not de-escalation. And so much more to come here. I know that the mayor's focus is to have this um, tied up and ready to go in six weeks' time, but this is a lot of work. Um, this is work that every single night I'm reading something, reviewing something, preparing it. Um, we have testimony coming up um, that will be uh, continue to be made available. And quite frankly, I would rather not try to look at a deadline and press it across the goal line when we know that the community is depending on us to get this right. So let me go uh, mute here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Davis. I see uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Thank you for that, Chair. And uh, well, Member Davis, that sounds like a lot of work. And uh, just to like give other folks like a frame of reference, like other communities and cities are standing up boards that are expected to be around a year long. So I commend you first uh, for, for being able to wade through these waters. Um, but I do have several questions. Um, and I wanted to start off with kind of like where you left off in any of those testimonies, were there any conversations around how civilians could be used in certain situations to get um, the possibility of the use of force all the way down to zero. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Um, Campbell Gooch, um, or Vice Chair Campbell Gooch. So, y yes, there's been conversation in the policy committee meetings. I can't speak for the other two. I'll be very frank with you. Um, they're led by other chairs there. But we have been talking about that. And in fact, I personally sent out I sent out one invitation specifically to that point because I think we need to hear from people who are not, um, let me put it very bluntly, I'm not going to have a meeting every week that is only uh, testimony from MMPD. That does not serve the purpose uh, holistically, that is leaning in one perspective. And so I share with them that we have found success within the COB when we open it up widely. Um, I welcome suggestions on that too, though, because I'm trying to build out the next four weeks of testimony within uh, the next four days, to be honest with you, because I think the committee members need to know who, who is coming and what they're gonna talk about, so their questions are relevant, if that makes sense. But I, I welcome ideas here, because I, I, I sure could use them. For sure, for sure. And, and, and the, first, the, the reason I asked that question is because uh, um, I'm thinking about the last time uh, uh, we were together, uh, Interim Chief Drake mentioned that uh, civilians could be used um, during mm -hmm. traffic enforcement. Um, and I know that there yeah. are board, like commissions across the country like really diving into what it would look like if civilians were used to do traffic enforcement because we know that harm is rarely done to police officers during traffic enforcement, but that's counter to what the national narrative is, which is that traffic stops are extremely dangerous for officers. Um, that's why deadly force needs to be there, but we know the data is telling us something different. Um, and so that's what I was saying. It seems like, and I commend like interim chief Drake for like even bringing that, that that's what um, civilians could be used on. So that's, that was my um, framing of that question. Um, and then also I wanted to ask and I think you just brought this up. I wanted to ask a question around, um, yes, so you mentioned how that there are multiple uh, different subgroups, I wanna call them, and you're the chair of one particular subgroup and you can't speak for the other ones. Is there a possibility we could get an update from the other chairs or other folks in other groups? I know, uh, other groups have people that I know on them, but I just wanted to throw that and see how you feel about that as a possibility of like spreading the workout. So you're not the one that have that has like this heavy load of updating us on the whole police commission. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. So the other, um, so I made the suggestion also that I believe the other chairs and vice chairs need to get on, even if it's just 30 minutes, come together and share what has come out of their last meeting. Um, but I'm happy to make uh, that that very pressed ask there too, because even if, let, let me be very clear, um, uh, the one of the vice, one of the chairs is uh, Judge Blackburn. Um, and then, uh, and she is her vice chair. I can't remember her name right now. I just met last week. Some of these people perhaps don't have the most immediate uh, availability, but their vice chair should be available. So I'll send that out very quickly because perhaps we could hear from them briefly next week during the uh, larger meeting. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, my, then my last two questions I'm gonna get out the way is um, as far as the data, mm -hmm. is there any way that we can disseminate that information to all board members as a way to bring the board members along to the work? I'm just trying to lessen, trying to think about creative ways to lessen your load. Mm -hmm. uh, Ashley, but yeah, if, if, can we get a way to like, like maybe forward that data to like all the board members as a way to bring it along, bring board members along? And then yeah. also, do you think that there would be a spot available for a COB member on the data committee? Yeah, I think that, um, so twofold. One, let me just note, I appreciate like the lessening of load on my part, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to continue to move forward here. But I also think there's a lot of value in every member of the COB having access and reading through this level set packet. I just need y'all to hear from Dr. Valier and others and myself about how these numbers are not uh, and should not be in ink. They still need work and they need to be um, revisited. Um, so, but I'll circle back on that and get you an answer. The uh, other part about the data committee, I think it's a great idea too, but I think y'all remember what I said last meeting. I think there's no reason why we shouldn't have 
uh, a COB minute member on each of the other two committees because now we have more than one member of the council represented on the commission. So they are public, they have to be publicly noticed um, and they fall, you know, they ring the bell now, they've already rung the bell. But I'll, I'll ask about the data component of it because certainly Dr. Valier will be here there, but it might be helpful to have perhaps a member of the executive committee or another member of the board to be present to listen in too. So I'll, I'll make that ask too. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch, I see uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Fitcher, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank Ashley for bringing all of this um, information to us. I did want to say that I spoke to Mr. Bunton because I was also concerned about the lack of the COB being involved in the other committees, which would be the Community Engagement Committee as well as the Workforce um, Committee. And so he said that he was gonna get back with me um, sometime either at the end of this week or next week because he wanted to um, yeah, talk about you know, um, how we could be involved. Um, because I think that oh. And as Mr. Campbell Gooch has stated, that in, in, in as well as Ms. Davis, that it's important that the COB be involved. Um, and it, with her being on this committee, it's very helpful for us to have a clear understanding of what's going on. And then I'd also like to give an opportunity um, once Ms. Davis is finished to talk um, for Mr. or Dr. Belier to talk about the data work group that um, he's going to be a part of and what he's up to. I had a question, um, Ms. Davis, is there anything we can do as the executive committee or the entire board to help facilitate or, you know, draft a policy or, you know, come up with a policy that we could use to, you know, encourage that MNPD relationship with the COB? Any, anything in writing, anything that we can do to keep it in front of the the policy policing commi committee or commission so that they can um you know put that forward and propose that uh yes yeah, so chair chair martinez i think it's a great question so twofold i, I didn't i failed to mention so executive director Fitcher will um well, so one dr valier will speak uh tomorrow and offer testimony re regarding consent decrees um and likely will follow up in uh peer uh, in a subsequent subsequent meeting as well. Director Fitcher will come and speak, um, and, and Director Fitcher can certainly speak better than I can on this, but about COB relationship, uh, the history of it. Um, but but principally, if there was a way to have, you know, and maybe it is just, you know, a list of five, a list of 10, or a small list of recommendations about what would help um, both improve relations and keep them strong between COB and MMPD, that would be fantastic. And I would quite frankly go back and ask uh, interim, interim Chief Drake and other, others to do the same on their end so that perhaps we can just find that natural alignment and write it into the recommendations that we submit. Um, and then the other piece is just as individuals or maybe also as a board, I think we really do need to encourage the mayor not to be so expedient in this approach that we don't do this the right way. And this is just purely me speaking as Ashley Davis. I'm not speaking as any other hat. I'm just concerned about us trying to fit into a small amount of space, something that to Mr. Campbell Gucci's uh, point is being done over a year in other cities of similar and smaller size. And I, I really truly am concerned about that. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, is there anything, I don't know, maybe we can bring up these, do we have, Mr. Campbell Gooch, examples of other communities that, uh, like you said, are doing this, that we can bring up to the mayor's office? Yeah, one specifically that's on the top of my mind right now is uh, Berkeley, California. They're, they're standing up a year long commission to see what it will look like to have um, um, on, unarmed civilians do traffic enforcement. Because I think like their numbers are saying like their traffic, like uh, usually the harm that's being done during traffic stops are, are usually like police to civilian, not civilian to police. And so I think like that was one way that they figured out um, what to do. Other, other commissions around the country are really leaning into uh, street-based mediation 
violence interrupting of violence interruption they're standing up what would it look like to have unarmed uh mental health participants um they're using they're taking things like um i know i'm about to say this wrong uh director fitcher please correct me but um we have uh like our flex team is being transferred to become like something like care officers like there's other um cities that are doing something similar but they're turning their they're taking their care officers um and putting them into like youth um kind of like the youth uh i don't know what to call it but we call it something else here but kind of like the youth uh like the youth task force and but also are like making sure that they're unarmed so it's like it's looking different across a broad spectrum but i want to say like the one that i off the top of my head that is doing the most work is uh berkeley california Thank you, Mr. Kamagooch. I think it would be helpful to hear from Dr. Verlier uh, to see what uh, his involvement on the data committee is going to be, has been. Um, um, so the data committee is meeting for the first time next week. Um, from my understanding from an email today, uh, myself, a representative uh, data scientist from the police department, and a member from each of the three committees of the of the policy of the police policy commission uh, will be on that committee. Um, I had pointed out during the meeting last week as soon as I didn't get the the level set packet and some other information until uh, just about an hour before the committee started. Um, and as when I saw it, I noticed some uh, pretty large discrepancies between. Uh, different reports so i had pointed that out and then we were invited to uh, participate in the data committee so um, i believe my involvement uh, will be since i have worked with the data and i have i have access to the use of force data um, and have been working with it we'll be really trying to figure out how do we get all of the numbers to line up where the inconsistencies are and then how do we actually make sure that we're having accurate counts and things are being coded and, and categorized correctly. And um, and so I think that'll be sort of my focus, um, as well as then how do we communicate that to the commission in a way that um, may be more uh, understandable than some of the um, information that was previously given. I think it's a great idea to, um, if we can disseminate the level set packet uh, to the COV members that they're able to take a look at it and really engage with it as well. Um, and tomorrow I will be presenting to the policy committee on consent decrees and um, policy trends in recommendations from consent decrees. And we are working on expanding that uh, analysis that we've conducted into um, what will become a policy advisory report from that will be submitted to the COB. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, Dr. Valier, do you think, uh, just your opinion, do you think the board should be brought along using the raw data, or do you think? that that is without uh, without narrative, do you think that that would be too hard to understand what's actually going on there and what the data is telling us? So the, the raw data are, you know, it's a spreadsheet of several thousand rows. Um, each row is an officer's report from an incident. incident incidents have multiple reports in them. It's a really complex, data set, um, it is publicly available. And um, so that's something that, you know, board members could have access to. Um, we, I think it'll be especially helpful, I think once we have a better sense of, you know, what the numbers look like from the hot data committee, and hopefully we get a better sense of that. I do think it's important, um, or that is information that we should be able to share 
There was also a report conducted by uh, the police department that they uh, did not release, uh, actively release publicly, but they conducted um, that they released in December, finished in December, um, that also addresses use of force that maybe that it would be of interest to board members. So not only is, like Ms. Davis said, it's kind of feels like we're rushing this, but it seems like we're rushing this with incomplete information and in that the data committee itself is seemingly, you know, the catching up and the members of the other committees are having to deal with the inaccurate data. Is that correct? Um, I, I think that, it certainly is, there's not a complete sense of what the data look like. Um, and without that information, it's hard to make many decisions based off of uh, what empirically the data say. So I think your assessment is correct on that front. I, you know, and I also, do think that you know this is a very quick process and without having some of that information i know um, in my conversations with miss cirillo and john, john bunton they have been trying to get that information um, right at the beginning so that commission members could have a, a good sense of what the data look like and with revisiting that um, it's not clear how that might impact the timeline Thank you, Dr. Villier. Uh, Mr. Kamaguchi. Yeah, thank you for that. I wanted to just um, also ask a question. So does it make sense to start, and this is for board members and staff, like I'm just curious, does it make sense to start like war gaming this out um, um, and planning for if the mayor's office decides to continue with the rapid study, what we should do with the numbers and just like how we can make sure that what is coming out is a clean product that will bring people along? I'm just curious about what other people think about planning out basically uh, from this conversation, worst case scenario. I'm curious to know why the timeline is what it is. Was there a specific reason for the six weeks or um, is this something that maybe we can advocate be lengthened if anybody knows? It's my understanding that the um, six weeks is to be able to have question, questions and recommendations sent to uh, police chief candidates in October, um, as so this can co coincide with the uh, police chief search. Was there, is there going to be a plan to, you know, implement these policy recommendations or is the idea that the new police chief will pick and choose what they want to implement? Um, I believe the, the request is that there would be written response from the police chief candidates so that their response would be able to inform the decision from the mayor on which candidate would be the best fit for Nashville. And once a new police chief was hired, they would take on the responsibility of determining which recommendations would be um, and how they would be implemented. Do we think then, or I'm, I'm thinking about this maybe being a separate process and maybe that there's a larger, longer envisioning process separate from this since this is so geared toward an interview. Mr. Sweeney. Well, perhaps this could be staged, you know, where there's an interim report that would come from the committees with the charge of the committees to 
you know, keep with those subjects and to work with the new police chief and the COB when the new chief comes in. Um, but that way, perhaps serving both purposes. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Um, do I thinking about next steps here? Um, we should reach out to see if the COB can get a briefing from each of the different committees there, just like we had one uh, with Ms. Davis. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um. I really, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off, Chair. Um, I was hoping that, I was curious about what you was gonna say, but what I was thinking is, um, I would like to seriously think about Ashley Davis's, uh, Board Member Davis, um, suggesting that we consider having multiple um, folks, or maybe one person on each of the other committees. Like I wanted to hold that and I didn't wanna like pass that over. Ms. Ross? Uh, Dr. Valier, how long do you think it would take to clean up the data? Since you looked at all the columns and rows and what's your thought on cleaning up that data? What's the time frame? Um, I don't know if I have a, could give a specific time frame since we have not started having conversations with the police department about specifically what that would take. Um, I don't think that it would, depending on sort of what, um, I don't think it would be a, an incredibly long process, um, but I don't feel that I have any good information on what that process would take. And I just want to piggyback on what Dr. Valier said um, in, in regards to Ms. Ross, that when the data was initially sent and it had numbers that appeared to be um, not correct, according to Dr. Valier, what he saw there was some issues raised. They resubmitted some other numbers after that. So Dr. Valier, do you want to talk about the, the, the corrected version that was sent out or some other version? Um, to let the board know what those numbers look like? Um, I, I think, so the additional information that was sent um, gives a breakdown of use of force by race of the subject and race and gender of the officer. Um, and that, um, yeah, I, I can't speak too much to just because I don't know exactly what was changed between the level set packet that was sent out and the additional data that was sent. Um, and so I can't speak too much to sort of what was changed between those two. Thank you, Dr. Valier. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch, to your point, I'm envisioning the response being, well, you know, it's already three meetings in, the next meeting is gonna be the fourth one, you know, it's already established, how can we um, add COB members to the different committees? How do you think we should respond to that? Um, I think we use the example of the city council member being added by the second meeting. And do we have any uh, idea of who we would want to be the COB representative on the remaining two committees? Yeah, I'm thinking that we um, get the confirmation from them and then possibly bring it up to the board or um, have an executive, having, like what Chair Davis I think was saying, have executive team members possibly do that as well. Do members of the executive committee have any interest in possibly joining on one of the two committees? Ms. Ross? 
I kind of think that we need to open it up to uh, other board members. I, I don't have a problem serving. I'm just disappointed that nobody's on the uh, community committee. Um, but uh, I think we should open it up to other board members who also may be interested. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Mr. Sweeney. I agree with that. And at this point, my schedule over the next month or so is very, very tight, so I couldn't. So what would be the quickest way to determine that since, you know, our, our next full board meeting isn't until the end of the month? Um, is this something that you can, that Director Fitchard, is this something that you can possibly ask uh, board members to gauge their interest? Yeah, I can send out an email um, asking board members to let me know, um, naming the two committees and then asking them if they would want to serve um, on either one of those committees. And then also I just need to know what the commitment level is on that so I can include that in the email. So I'm not sure, I know they meet once a week, I just need to know the dates and the dates that they meet um, since that stuff has already been set but I can do that and send that out this week for sure. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. I would also like to um, voice that I would be willing to volunteer if none of the other board members can make those committees. Which um, committee would you to serve on? Um, whichever one's that, sp that space for me. You okay. Know, I really, you know, um, what, whichever way my orders go. So then Director Fitcher, you can uh, reach out to the board to see that. I don't know how to gauge the commitment level. Um, judging from Ms. Davis's report, it seems like it's a very, um, it's a I would say yeah. it's a robust commitment for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I know that they have lots of homework and things of that nature, but I'm sure that if the board, you know, can participate. And even, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing here is you have to get with Mr. Bunton um, and see um, if we can, you know, get into those spaces as well. So hopefully that would help us, you know, and help the board members make that determination. Definitely, I can connect with Mr. Bunton um, either this week or early next week to to talk about this some more. So is there anything else on um, the Policing Policy Commission before we move on? I think we have some next steps, so I will reach out to Mr. Bunton to discuss adding uh, COB members to the remaining two committees and uh, Director Fitchard will start to gauge interest from uh, other board members to see who may want to serve on those committees. And then I think that I think the third step there is also um, inviting the other chairs from the other two committees to um, maybe uh, come to our board meeting or like send us a report on what's happening or something. Did yes. we talk about that too? Yeah, okay, all right. That is a good idea. Um, I can reach out to the other two uh, chairs of the committees to see if they would be available to come to our next board meeting. Okay, all right, sure. All right, uh, and I think we can move on to the rest of the agenda items there with you, Director Fitchard, uh, starting with the community safety town hall meetings. Okay, thank you. So we have, we've had two safety town hall meetings. Um, I just want to give you some numbers on those. And so the and I'll get into some of the technological issues that we were also experiencing. So the first community safety town hall meeting, um, our first one, we, how we spread the word, we posted to Facebook and Twitter three times. We had 22 retweets, seven Facebook chairs. We posted on MNCOs and MHRC's national.gov webpages. 
it, the information was sent to 33 community groups. MHRC also sent out to their constituents, um, and it was also mentioned on News Channel 5. The event attendance, we had 18 total comments that were pre-recorded call-ins or form submissions. We had 45 call-in listeners um, that were people who were um, attendees via WebEx. They were listening, and then we had 190 live viewers via MNN. So that's for the first town hall meeting. The second town hall meeting, we posted it to Facebook and Twitter three times. There were 11 retweets, 13 Facebook shares. It was posted on MNCOs and MHRC's national.gov web pages. It was sent to 60 community groups and nonprofits. Um, we also did a press release with event details, submitted to national.gov and posted to social media. There was a press release with event details sent to 22 news media outlets, news and media outlets. Um, MHRC also sent out to their constituents. It was mentioned on News Channel 5. It was mentioned on 92Q. There was a radio ad on WPLN that had about 20,000 impressions. Um, the event attendance was 33 total comments, and those comments include those that are pre-recorded, called in, or form submissions. There were 40 call-in listeners. Um, those are the people who were attendees and listening via WebEx. And then we had 108 live viewers via MNN. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the problems that we experienced. So one of the problems that we didn't know about until this week, actually, or the end of last week and the beginning of this week, and we worked on it today, is that there was a problem with people who were dialing into the 629 number, which is the number that we have assigned to us, um, the area code 629, um, if you use T-Mobile or Sprint. So apparently there was some issues with the towers connecting and so if you were a T-Mobile user and you dialed into a 629 number, you would not get anything. It would just it beep and hang up. And so that's been fixed now. Um, ITS was able to get with the engineers with T-Mobile and find out it was, I wouldn't say it was an easy fix, but it was a fix that they weren't aware of. And so by having this community safety town hall meeting, they were able to fix that, um, that issue and we checked it today and it's corrected. So those people who use T-Mobile as their service provider will now be able to dial into that number without any issues, hopefully. So, um, and I just wanna say our next meeting is Monday, September the 21st, and it will focus on uh, these particular groups. Um, and so we want the focus groups would be black and Hispanic residents, the LGBTQ community, youth, immigrant and refugee communities. And so we want those those demographics and those people to call in and to voice their um, concerns about public safety and what they would like to see in a police chief. And then um, our next meeting is, which is our last meeting, the fourth, the fourth meeting um, is pending for Monday, September the 28th. Um, but it isn't confirmed as of yet, but it will focus on these groups, which are faith leaders, seniors, formerly incarcerated, and residents experiencing homelessness or housing insecurities. And the reason why we can't have the meeting next Monday on the 14th is because MHRC is, um, MHRC is having their regular monthly board meeting since we had a holiday, um, which was Monday, Labor Day. So we had to push it back a week. So. Um, hopefully everything will move forward the way that it's supposed to. I think that we have worked on a plan regarding when we have that dead time. So we have worked on the run of show. So we, I think that we have uh, figured out how we're going to do the next two meetings so that we won't have that. Um, and instead of having multiple moderators, we will have one moderator, one closer. Um, and we've just worked on the logistics of the meeting. So hopefully things will move and be streamlined and run a lot smoother. So any questions in regards to that? Mr. Kamaguchi. 
Thank you for laying that out succinctly, Director. Um, first, I want to commend y'all on doing that. That was not that. I've gotten calls about how much people enjoyed being able to share their opinions and things like that. So I want to like commend you. If I was in person, I'd be clapping. Um, also, uh, what do you think about doing something like a teaching after these rounds? And what and what I'm thinking is just like uh, just like a te a digital teaching where it's just like people are getting taught the basics around police accountability, um, and then also how to file a complaint and why we need transparency in these levels. So I'm just curious about like what you think about that as a phase two to this type of like community engagement. Oh, I absolutely love that idea. We have been planning for something like this um, with my team as well. And so I think with, with your idea and your help, um, I think that we should do that. I think that since we're moving and we're gonna, it, it obviously for whatever reasons with this um, COVID, um, with the COVID numbers, um, I think that this moving into a next phase of making certain that we are accessible, that we are teaching and training people on what it is that we do and what it is that they need from us, I think is a wonderful idea. And I'm all in on that. So that could be our next move it's moving in October. I, I, I would say, let's get it, let's get it going. Um, and I, and I just to follow that up, I, what you know what I'm saying I'm willing to do whatever you need uh as far as like supporting in that I'm, and I don't know chair if that needs like any official action from the board I don't think so uh Miss Ross I think it's been um uh, approached by several groups uh particularly some elderly at different churches and community groups and I see some council meetings. So I had relayed that information to Dr. I mean Jill. And um I know she's attending one call and meeting for a church tomorrow to talk about the community on the site board. So I too think that's a good idea. Yeah, and I, I appreciate Ms. Ross sending out um information that I've been passing on to our community liaison. Um, because I think it is time for us to start really moving forward and sharing our the work that we do um, with with the, um, with the with the community here. And I just like to say this that I have been talking to other agencies across this country, um, as well as other um, other experts in the field of you know policing and policing accountability. And they have all said that they have been keeping watch and keeping an ear to the ground on what's happening in Nashville, which is, you know, which really um, makes me feel good about the work that we're doing here. There's a lot of interest being generated across this country about what we're doing. And so I want to make certain that the things that we're doing is impactful and meaningful um, because I have heard from other people um, who on Twitter that we've been getting shout outs from other people and things of that nature. So people are following closely the work that we're doing as it pertains to the memorandum of understanding, you know, this policing accountability issue that we have addressed on multiple occasions, the sharing of data, all of that. And so I'm looking forward to definitely, you know, getting out more um, in the community, whether it's on Zoom or WebEx or however, so that people know the services that we provide, because we're working really hard to make certain that this community has what they need if they're experiencing any type of um, issues with policing in Nashville. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, I also wanted to say, like, uh, Director, if you and your staff trying to get out to North Nashville, that is my jam right there. Like, I'm willing to go door to door. Whatever we got to do, just let me know. I will. Thank you so much for that. I have a question. Do, from what I envision from Mr. Kamaguchi's idea, maybe something like a webinar or something like a live session, could it be hosted outside of WebEx? Like, could it be a Facebook live session? Because I think we could reach more people that way than on WebEx. I don't find WebEx to be particularly welcoming. Um, and then we could see 
your faces. I think that's important for the community to see, you know, who, who MNCO is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brindsay and I had talked about that. She set up a whole little plan for us. I wouldn't say little plan, sorry. She set up a plan for us in regards to how to um, do some live Facebooks, um, also do some Zoom meetings, um, because I think that you're right. I think that there are some um, limitations when it, in regards to WebEx, and so I think having live Facebooks and Zoom and having, you know, meetings where we are all, you know, able to like be present and ask and people can ask us questions. Um, she had a whole, she had a, like a, she had a whole blueprint on how we would do it. But I think that we can kind of move past some of this stuff because we, people know who we are already. So some of that was introductory, but I think that um, letting people know how to file a complaint, what the process is, also just meeting us, the team in, in, in general, um, and talking about, you know, the different, the different levels of experience that we have or what we do specifically, I think is super important. So yes, to your answer, um, yeah. Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, it's a good idea for them to know who, who we are, who you are as staff of the MNCO as well. Um, there weren't any more questions. No, I don't think so. So what can we, can we do anything to get this plan in motion since the plan already exists or, um, is there already, already a plan to start it at some point? You know, I, there is, but we just hadn't picked any dates, but I think that if we could move in, start right in October, that would be good for us. Like once we get through this month, um, because this month is pretty, like I think the calendar is pretty full. Um, and so I think that if we could move and start like focusing and she and I can start planning and if we need to call in Mr. Campbell Gooch or yourself or Ms. Ross, um, we can to start, you know, the process of setting up a live um, on Facebook or even just a, you know, a live um, webinar you know, and inviting people to it through Zoom, I think it would be fantastic. So I'll get back with you on that and pick some dates and see what dates are work for you all, because I think it's important to have the community members involved in that as well. Great. I, so the, the community members on the board, I mean. Right. Um, and I have um, a lot of experience with Facebook Live that I get from my day job. So if you need any technical support on that, I'm more than happy to um, sit with you or, or Brenzi to see how we can make it uh, run as smoothly as possible. Okay, perfect. Ms. Ross, did you have, I think Ms. Ross had her hand. Jill, I, I did. I just wanted to make sure that we don't forget about people who are not on Facebook webinar or whatever. I think the meeting tomorrow is a phone call in for some elderly individuals. So let's think outside the box also. Yes, ma'am. And I think that we can we can conference call. Um, we have through WebEx, Web, 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 through, sorry, through WebEx, uh, WebEx, I'm sorry, we can, um, we can set up a conference call that might be really easy, um, Ms. Ross, for those who can't or who don't have, you know, access um, to Facebook or social media platforms. I can set that up and send out a phone number, they dial in, and then they all are adjoined. We're all enjoying together. So that's another option that we have as well through ITS and WebEx. So they would just dial a number and then it would give them a, a code. They would put the four digit PIN number in and then we all would be on the call. So thanks for that reminder. I think if there are no more questions, we can move on to the memorandum of understanding now. Okay, thank you. So the memorandum of understanding, um, I just wanna kind of give us a brief update on where we are with that. So Assistant Director Clausey and I attended an access to records meeting on Tuesday, September the 1st. And in our last meeting, we decided that we weren't going to actually have this meeting, but since um, I spoke with Mr. Bunton and it seemed as if, um, you know, Mr. It was kind of late to try to cancel it because 
legal director, Bob Cooper, had put a lot of time into preparing for this meeting. So we went ahead with the meeting and um, the meeting included Metro Legal Director Bob Cooper, DA General Funk, and his team, Chief Mike Hager and John Bunton of the mayor's office. So we discussed MNCO's access to records and received an updated list of specific cases that have an additional layer of confidentiality protections, this is, which are other than Rule 16 and the Tennessean case. And we discussed how we would be able to access certain records in an open case with this, with those protections. And some of those protections are, um, sorry. So the list of added protections, these are, these are particular instances that have an additional confidentiality protection. Some of those would be, um, actually it's 11. So number one would be rape and sex crimes related to adults. Number two would be child sexual abuse records and information. Number three would be child abuse records and information. Number four would be domestic violence and orders of protection. Um, number five would be juvenile offenses. Number six would be health and mental health records um, because of course HIPAA and various state laws. Um, number seven would be con confidential informant information. Number eight would be criminal intelligence information field interviews, crime stopper tips. Um, number nine would be expunged arrest records, files or information. Number 10 would be TBI records. And number 11 would be information that is gleaned from NCIC ties or the inlets and protected under TBI or FBI rules. So what they're basically saying is those are, those are categories that have additional protections that are not rule 16, but just additional protections in the state stature. Um, and it, so in order to get certain records from them, from MMPD, it, the DA would have to authorize us to receive or to review those records. And they created a new form that require us to attach our original complaint form. The form has four responses, right? So after you fill it out, they can either, number one, um, they can say the records are attached, here you are. Number two, the records are returned to MMPD as the matter is not an open prosecution. Number three, the records cannot be provided by the DA's office due to legal confidentiality exceptions. And they would give us an explanation on what that is. And then there was a number four that just said other. So basically, when I reviewed this, I would, I'm would i gonna give you guys a sample scenario to kind of get you to have an understanding of what this actually means. So a scenario could be something like this, that a person who has an open criminal case and wants to make a complaint about an alleged MMPD excessive use of force during the course of their arrest would be able to make the complaint but the process of the MNCO getting circuit certain records could essentially be held up if the open case falls into one of the 11 categories listed that have the added protections. Um, for instance, if, if I'm just going to use this as, a, as an example, if um, a person who is charged with some type of sex crime um, also said that during the commission of that person's custodial arrest, they were beaten severely by the police department. And so we want the records that pertain to this arrest. We could be denied those records because of, you know, the added protection under sex crimes related to adults. Um, so that's, that's one scenario. And I'll, I take questions from you at the end. I want to kind of get through this. Um, this, the, the next thing we talked about was Deputy Chief Hagar, he authorized the suspension of the requirement that we fill out this MMPD 720 public records request form. Um, our, our staff can now make their requests using the Nashville.gov accounts. But, you know, the irony here is the records will still go to the public records coordinator and he used language that this essentially is a state mandated position that allows for MMPD to document and track records requests to ensure um, and document compliance with state law on public records requests. 
So when I read that, it sounds as if they are still, you know, marking our records as public records requests. I don't know why, but that's what that that's what his language was. Um, and, 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 and then also I want to mention that Assistant Director Clausey reached out to the TBI liaison to discuss our MOU meeting. We haven't heard back from them yet. We will follow up with them tomorrow and hopefully we can get on their calendar next week to have some discussions. Um, as it pertains to the MOU um, for MMPD, we have had some back and forth with dates and changes and making, you know, making room in people's schedule. Um, and so the last thing that I heard a few minutes ago um, is that we might be able to meet um, Tuesday from 3.30 to 5. Um, and I think that, I think that um, Acting Chief Drake would also be able to be available um, for that time. So it looks like um, everyone will be available to have that MOU discussion excuse me, Tuesday from 3.30 to 5. So that's all I have for that. Um, I'll take questions now if you have any. Thank you, Director Pritchard. I have a question. Do we know how other um, city agencies request records from MNPD? They're, I assume they're not routed through this uh, public records person. Well, that's a little difficult for me to answer because Every city has a different method. Um, I think that there is pretty much, a, I wouldn't say that what is happening is unique just to Nashville. I think that most public accountability agencies that deal with policing are also having records issue. I mean, it's, it is, um, it is something that is happening regularly. It's really discouraging, but um, I think that NACO has helped us to try to navigate through that. Um, a lot of, remember, a lot of um, civilian agencies are connected under the umbrella of a police department and not necessarily completely independent as we are. And so it is, um, I, I can't really say um, to speak with, you know, much knowledge on what other people are doing specifically. Thank you, and Mr. Sweeney. Um, yeah, um, Director Fitchard, um, I, I started to go through the list that you sent us today of the various extra categories of documents. And I noticed that in some of them, it doesn't actually seem to have any prohibition at all regardless of what the information that you were provided. Um, so for example, on your number one on the sex crimes, um, mm -hmm. although there is a, a provision on confidentiality, Q5 seems to authorize us to get it. On the other hand, something like number two, um, seems that there's no provision under which the DA could ever give it to us. Right. So a lot of this is not, and from going through, it looks like much of this is not controlled by the DA. And so the DA couldn't waive it. Um, but, right. I, but I suggest that this is something that should be closely looked at um, with with um, uh, Mr. Pinkley to go through and look at the specific provisions and see what they are and see what effect they seem to have on us. And then to figure out in the event or in the face of a prohibition, what does that mean? Does that mean that we get redacted documents or we get no documents at all? Um, because does it perfect protect particular information like somebody's identity or does it protect us from from getting an overall report my my sense is that some of this it's fully protected like juvenile investigations and that 
if 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 it's a police record regarding a juvenile investigation, we might not be able to get any of it. Ever. Um, where other things we could get what we want just with certain things redacted. So I, I, I think that we should be careful about treating this as a one size fits all, where it looks like there may be several different situations and, and it might be helpful to figure out which ones are going to be most common to us and how we can get the parties to deal with it in a way that would produce us produce to us the bulk of what we will need. Okay, sure. Um, I, th I appreciate that. Um, I do think that there was, a, we brought up juveniles and I can't remember every detail. Um, and he mentioned a waiver um, that we could sign a waiver. I'm gonna ask Assistant Director Clausey to jump in and see if, since this meeting was over two weeks ago, and I, I, I did write down the information in regards to the waiver because I was concerned about not being able to get um, information regarding juvenile cases as well. Um, and so we had a little bit of discussion regarding, you know, we could get a waiver signed by the um, juvenile or the, the child's parent um, and so that they could release the records to us. I still don't know if that would happen um, without having some type of conversation with, um, I believe, Judge Sheila Calloway and her assistant, Kathy Steinbeck, I think that, or Sinbeck, I think that those are, we need to probably, you know, talk to them about that. Do you have anything to add to that, um, Mr. Clausey? Mr. Clausey, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. You're speaking. Well, that's okay. So basically, um, that's so that's one of the things that I, I and I do. I think you're right, Mr. Sweeney. We probably need to. Um, sit down and figure this out. Um, I did talk to Mr. Bunton yesterday afternoon. Um, one of the things is he and Mr. Cooper both, um, I think, you know, we're waiting on General Funk is what they said. Um, he's waiting on General Funk to respond and determine whether or not we will have access to the records that we need through the DA's office. But like you said, some of these records would probably never be available to us. And so, even if they're not available to us, one of my other things is some of those records that we might need. I, I mean, I, I don't know if we would, you know, if even if he may not give us a copy, if he would um, allow us to review a copy. I don't know. And so that is something that we need to discuss with um, with General Funk when um, we hear back from him. You able to hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, sorry, but I don't know what happened. My setup just didn't work. Um, I was, and, and I have nothing really to, to put in. I thought, uh, Director Fitcher, what you said was exactly what I remember about getting a, you know, having to get a waiver from the parent or guardian of the juvenile, and that would be something that probably could get us through that process if we ever dealt with a juvenile and us needing their records. So my comment was, you had covered it. Well, thank you. Thanks. Any other, uh, I guess, any other questions regarding this? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Sweeney. Um, after your meeting last week about the documents, um, I believe that there was an email that Mr. Causey sent to everybody that said this is what I understood we've agreed to and that then there was a response back from Chief Hager who said no I didn't agree to any of that and that with with all the participants involved on the emails and that then there was some involvement or intervention by um Mr. Button, where he concurred and there was an agreement that 
what Mr. Causey had summarized was correct and that we weren't going to have to go through the DA process as to the normal acquisition of documents. Did I misunderstood that sequence? Because that's not how I hear it described today. Right, so we had that email exchange and then I received a, you know, I received a call from Mr. Bunton that basically said that MMPD has agreed to provide us the records and that they were just waiting for Mr. Cooper, director of legal, um, Metro Legal, to let them know that this was not a Rule 16 issue and that they could release those records. And from my understanding, we're talking to Mr. Bunton, that is still MMPD's position. Um, of course, with this new list of 11 different, um, I, I'm assuming that any records, they believe that any records that pertain to the, the 11 things, the 11 topics that are categories that I just read off, those are things that we would have to go through the DA's office to get. But anything else we should be able to have access to. And that that's not that is also, I believe, what our DA liaison, Miss Jenny Charles, has also stated in an email exchange that there's gonna be on a case by case basis, that there will be uh, times where we might request something that MMPD may have, for instance, let, let me just use the case example that they use. In a case example with a case, let's just say that's an open case that's been open, a cold case, let's use a cold case that has been open for many years. It is actually an open, and it may even be an open active case, but it there's no, there there isn't any prosecution on the case because they don't have a particular person or a subject in custody. And so they used that as an example and stated that on cases like that, that they would have a dialogue with MMPD and certain records on a, on a case like that would have to go through their office. But on the regular, um, the, re the reports that we're requesting, the records that we're requesting are not Rule 16 violations. And so that's where we were and that's where we landed. And then when I spoke to Mr. Bonton yesterday, he said that what they're waiting now is just to get some clarity um, from General Funk regarding the, the 11 categories and our access to those. Director, but just to clarify, we don't have to go to the DA to get the records. It's that MNPD will request the DA's opinion on whether or not they MNPD can release the records to us. Yes, so what, what has happened here is if when we make our request from MNPD, we should be able to get all the records that we want. If there are cases that fall under, what they're saying is if there are cases or records that fall under open cases that are these types of crimes, right? These alleged type of crimes or fall into juvenile or health and mental health records that we would want, which we would not request from them anyway. Um, or if there's a case that involves a CI or um, it's, it's a case for expungement. Um, and some of this refers to like data too, when we're doing like, you know, analysis on records or data. So some of this came up and that is why we have this kind of comprehensive list. We, you know, according to what I was told by Ms. Charles and Mr. Bunton is that we should not have to go through the DA's office to get records. That the only time that we would have to go through the DA's office is if the case had these um, particular, they were for these particular, if if an open case was for this type of particular crime. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Does it make a difference if it's an open case or a cold case, if it comes under those 11 categories? From my sampling of the statutes, it doesn't. So 
So let me hold on one second. I, I would agree too that if it's if it's under one of those 11 and there's a closed case even on it, that we would still have to go through the same process of getting those records that they would not be uh, released by the MNPD. That's the way I understood it. Especially so, things okay. like juvenile and uh, expunged, expunged records and things like that. So this is what this is what we were told, just so I can clear this up a little bit. It says, check item two. And check item two, which is on this re records request form that you guys don't have yet. I may have sent it, but if not, I will send it. It says request return to MMPD as the matter is not an open prosecution. So it says check item two refers to cases that have final adjudications, judgments of guilt that have been entered against the defendant or incidents um, in which no arrest was made and there is not an active and open criminal investigation. Um, we brought up an old closed case that was brought up, yes, I mean, an open, an, a cold case that was brought up yesterday as an example of a case where no arrest has been made, but there is an active open investigation. Thus, you and I, that is Ms. Charles and whoever's over at MNPD, would need to work through some of those on a case-by-case -case basis. However, the bulk of incidents that fall into this category will need no further review under Tennessee Rules of Criminal Procedure Rule 16. That was what I was, that was the last um, correspondence that I received. What that sounds like, Jill, to me though, is a discussion of whether Rule 16 applies. That sounds like it's a discussion before Bob Cooper has um, confirmed our position that Rule 16 doesn't apply. Because none of, none of that would seem to have any application uh, if there isn't Rule 16 and whether or not any of those things occur. So I'm, I'm I'm not sure where that leaves us because what I was understanding to have occurred was that Rule 16 no longer has anything to do with any request that we have. That we can make our requests to MNPD and we can get whatever we want unless it's prohibited under one of these 11 statutes. And then if it's somehow or affected by one of these 11 statutes, and if it's then affected by one of these 11 statutes, then we have to go through another process in order to get the DA's approval. Although from reading some of the statutes, I don't see that they have any say in it, but, but you know, that's where they would seem to come in only if any of these apply and having nothing to do with open or closed cases or rule 16. Yeah, and I, th I think you're right. And I think that w the last conversation that I had with Mr. Bunton, which is, you know, Mr. Cooper is drafting up something to give to MMPD um, regarding the rule 16 issue. And so that is in the works now. And they were also waiting on a response from District Attorney General Funk. That's what I that's what I heard yesterday afternoon. So I don't have an answer, a complete answer yet. Um, uh, I think that that's basically when we have our MOU discussion, which is apparently happening on Tuesday. I think that what we want in our MOU is unfettered access to these records. So I don't know um, where they are with this. Right. And I mean, so I, I need to do a follow up. Maybe in our form request that we're going to use, we can take a number of these 11 categories of things and say in the initial request as it goes through, we are not requesting any information that is, is protected by any of the following statutes. 
and maybe that would short circuit some of it. it but I, I think that this is something that is is going to require close work in the weeds in order to make you know the 98 percent of stuff that we want flow to us smoothly and then be able to you know talk about the other two percent of our issues but if we don't address it on the front end the two percent could end up screwing up the 98 percent right i agree with that and you know yes. so, so maybe we could attach something and say we don't we don't care about any of this kind of information it wouldn't necessarily right. be a thing on the 11 on the list of 11 but it could cover a lot of it right i think that's a good idea because that's true i mean most of that stuff we won't need anyway so yeah i agree mr campbell gooch um i'm just trying to i'm trying to clear uh my mind and like uh make sure i understand what's being said and then um i'm also curious around what strategies we can use because i'm in a hundred percent agreement that we should be having like unfettered access and i just wanted to also hold here that we are a official metro government body so it seems that they would give us unfettered access they're willing to accept our services um and they're willing to accept us as a metro body but um so if if, if i'm understanding correctly and excuse me if this has been misstated if this has already been stated but there are essentially 12 types of records that we will not have access to as far as what has been said so am i am i reading that right Yeah, there's 11 categories. Um, so for instance, if we just use number nine on the list, which is expunged records, like if, if, a, if a record is expunged, then basically we would not have access to it because of course it, it doesn't exist. It, it doesn't actually, it's not supposed to exist. But of course, when your records are expunged, you know, the police department still might have it your information in their system according to whatever the rules um, whatever the law says um, that police departments can still have that information but basically we you know we would not be able to get any records that pertain to an expunged arrest so yeah and so that and so that would limit our ability to track um use of force complaints or complaints against officers like that have been expunged so we wouldn't be able to see a full picture of a police of an officer's record am i reading that right i'll jump in here i i think unless if an officer's use of force was something that he got criminally convicted for and then was expunged from his record maybe if that makes sense i'm not too familiar with the expungement law i mean mr pinkley do you have anything to add into this okay. or mr valier I don't really know the the details for the expungement law and how that would relate to an open record. So I don't, I could do some research into that, but I don't want to give an answer off the top of my head and that'd be incorrect. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the expungement statute has to do with the expungement of criminal charges. And so if, if uh, what Mr. Campbell Gooch was asking about is in a personnel record, uh, rather than because of a criminal charge. Uh, the statute wouldn't apply to it. Something else might, but that statute wouldn't apply to it at all. Um, and thank you for that. I think that makes it way clear for me. Then, um, so 
uh, what would what strategy should we use moving forward? Can I make a suggestion? I, I think that with a meeting next week on the MOU, that should bring all this document stuff to a head. And if it is true that they are going to abandon the position that they've taken on the Rule 16, and they're going to produce the documents that we requested, and that they're merely going to, merely might not be the right word, but they're going to um, require additional review of documents that fall within certain statutory protected criteria, which would prevent not just us, but most anybody from getting that information, that then it looks like we may be at the 98%, 2% point. And we should make sure that the 98% is gonna flow right. And as to the 2%, figure out from a close look at the statute, which things actually um, we're concerned with that might interfere with what we need to do on a regular basis. And, and, and then try to address those um, and, and then deal with the lesser issues that come up from time to time as they come up. Um, I would also presume, and, and Dr. Valier, um, not necessarily right now, but long-term can, can, I'm sure, opine on this, that anything that's pure data um, probably doesn't come under any of the prohibitions anyway. Um, so it's, that, that's for, you know, policy type information as distinguished from um, complaint type information. So I, I think we also um, need to be clear, and I think that the MIU is clear of making distinctions between different categories of documents in that way. But I would, I would think the MOU should bring all of this to a head um, and, and hopefully get everybody using the right language now and no longer talking about open or closed cases, meaning from the DA side or from the police side. Um, and, and then it's just clear documents are documents and we're entitled to almost all of them. And the other matters need to get, get dealt with as a general rule when they can and then specifically when they need. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Um, Mr. Kamaguchi, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yes, it does. Thank you for the chair. Yeah, I think it, it definitely does answer my question. Um, and one area of concern that I want to point to is the limitation of our auditing abilities um, that uh, the executive, executive feature brought up. So I just wanted to also like voice that as well. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I want to. I want to say and direct the feature. Uh, feel free to jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong on what I, what I'm taking from what you have said. Um, it seems like if we don't have access to certain records and then we want to audit things um, and review certain policies, then we won't. We wouldn't be able to paint a full picture of how the policy is functioning in real time. And so um, therefore it feels like whatever recommendations um, that we present would only be limited to what's being said on paper and not how like people are experiencing them. Yeah, let me jump in and kind of give you guys a, uh, an idea of how that works. So for instance, with the use of force records, Dr. Valier ordered, you know, uh, requested 92 or 95 samples. They were just, you know, 
chosen, selected randomly. When those when those records got over to um, so for so we requested the records. We had some kind of dialogue back and forth on you know what what we needed and why we needed those records. Um, and finally, those records were released to to MMP, from, from MMPD and they went straight to the DA's office, all the records that were requested. The, the, and they were in paper form. So they were, they sent all the records in paper form um, instead of on a thumb drive. And so they sent all the records over there. What happened was DA Jenny Charles, who was our liaison, spent, I wanna say over, she said she spent, I wanna say over 21 hours of time going through each record individually to determine if the records had information that needed to be redacted, fell into certain categories. And this is where we get this, this list because some of the records that we selected randomly um, were cases that were fell under the expunged case or TBI or had NCIC or something attached to it. And so, you know, we talked about that and she talked about how she had to contact you know, the AG's office to find out if they could release these records and go through a whole process. And, you know, I had talked to Dr. Valera regarding that. And, you know, they could have simply just denied those records instead of redacting um, because of the work that apparently it took to get the redactions in place. Um, and they could have just denied those samples, but instead they went through them and she, she went through each one of them, which took, I want to say a, a longer than a week. I don't know how long it was. And Dr. Valeria, you can talk about that. It was a lengthy amount of time for them to go through. And it was, I'm assuming for each record, let's just say of one of the 95, it may have had, you know, 50, 60 different records in that particular file. So yeah, we need to figure out a way that doesn't impede with the work that Dr. Valier and um, Ms. Orozco do, the work that they are doing in regards to um, auditing or doing data research and analysis. So I think that you, um, yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question, Mr. Campbell Goose, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what that looked like. Uh, yes, yes, you, you definitely answered um, my question. So should a part of the MOU be how we receive records? Yeah, I think that that is in the MOU and how we would like to receive these research records as well. We would like to um, have, you know, I think personally what they should do is create a um, some type of uh, you know, where we can get this stuff uploaded to us on a private, you know, privately where, you know, it is encrypted and safe. And then we wouldn't have all of this, you know, these issues if that we had access to um, some form of, you know, electronic access to the records and they, they would be able to transfer them to us in a safe, very protected, you know, secure way. And I think Dr. Valier may have, do you have something to add to that, Dr. Valier, in regards to how we want or how you think that we should receive these records? So the the most recent audit records were sent from the police department to the district attorney's office as digital records. And then as part of the redaction process, they were printed in order to securely redact those. Um, you know, the in order to be able to do some of those random audits, you know, it is important that we're able to you know, get as much as possible. Um, though, since we are going through a process of randomization, having some missing records is not going to impact us greatly, um, unless there's sort of systematic categorical um, areas where there might be um, any sort of deficiencies. So, you know, for instance, if all if we request records and there were a systematic a systematic process where sexual assault records had um, specific types of issues, then um, we wouldn't be able to catch those. And so, those are things that as as we're doing the research, which we'll just be very clear about sort of what we do and don't have access to, and sort of the scope of what our audit could be able to 
pick up and what the limitations are. And that's certainly a research limitation, but it, I don't think it uh, necessarily impacts our research to the point where we're not able to um, do comprehensive audits. Dr. Valier, was any, the records that we received that were redacted, did any of those redactions then interfere with the research? Were you not able to obtain a certain data? No, um, the, any of the redactions that were made were, were mostly around um, names or addresses, contact information, um, information that we're not, uh, we're not interested in, in in sort of reviewing. So as we're looking at use of force records, we're mostly interested in the, you know, how the narratives are written, the review process, the chain of command process. And so and redacted about the specific cases is not inhibiting our ability to look at how those are, how those are reviewed how the department is, is working with those records, the types of information that ends up in the narrative. So ultimately then our audit capability isn't being restricted here. It's just another kind of obstacle, another hoop we have to jump through that may make the records take more time. I, I would not use the word restricted. I, I would say that there are limitations to any audit and you know that you know there are some that are expunged that we don't get and you know that's a limitation that we're aware of as we're um, doing that research thank you dr valier mr sweeney yes uh dr valier um with the knowledge now of what's in those files of a, a particular file would there have been a way to have narrowed the request to just get the narrative information that you were looking for and then to avoid the, the potential need for redactions? Um, I don't believe all of the information is kept in sort of a, um, a retrievable database in a way that the narratives can be pulled out um, since there are checklists included that there's handwritten notes from supervisors, um, commanders are signing off by hand, making notes around sort of additional information that's needed. And that's all very important to see sort of the approval process. So I don't believe that only retrieving specific, just the narrative would um, be able to capture the uh, chain of command approval process. And I didn't necessarily mean that it would be in a data format, but if you request, for example, forms X, Y, and Z, that would be in such files that they would have the narrative and the approval levels, or is it just so spread out throughout your typical file that that type of narrow request just wouldn't be practical. I'm not sure that would be practical. Um, I, you know, the majority of the files are um, are really officer narratives, witness statements, um, often photos of any injuries, and then supervisor reviews. And so, I don't believe that sort of a more narrow request of specific parts of use of force records specifically would, um, I, don't, I don't believe that that would be systematic or that, that would be an effective way to make sure that we're getting all of the relevant information. Thank you. Are there any more questions on this issue? So my takeaway is that there's really, there's nothing in the upcoming MOU negotiation that we need to add to the MOU or anything like that. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I think the MOU is very thorough. And uh, yeah, I don't think that there's anything else that we need to add to it at this point. And <clears throat> my sense also is that it is um, detailed and specific, but it's not going to get to the level of minutia and that some of this stuff will be at that level when you're dealing you know with these forms and that's how come i think it's necessary you know kind of almost at an sop level um to have reviewed these 11 categories and figure out you know how they actually involve what we want and then to figure out how we best deal with those either by saying in particular request we don't care about XYZ information or XYZ reports or, or something. And, and at least that when we deal with them, we have a strategy and we are informed as to what should be available to us and why and what we recognize um, isn't or isn't except by whatever means the statute specifically provides we can get it. I don't think there's going to be a one size fits all and, and therefore there's going to be, you know, a, 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 a particular um, time in the weeds when we get to any of those issues. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Um, with that, I think we can move to the next uh, agenda item with the proposed resolution reports. Director Fitchard. Okay, sure. Um, so the proposed resolution reports, I put this on the agenda just to kind of get, um, so that we could get an update on where we are with this. So Assistant Director Clausey and I have a meeting with the FOP attorney, Jack Bird, on Friday, September the 11th, um, to discuss, I guess, a couple um, cases that he has, um, that he's representing officers, as well as that PRR, really to discuss the PRR process and allow room for his feedback on the process and to ask us any questions that he has before we move forward. Um, we also have seven cases that are ready for review, but they are not ready to move forward to the board because we still have to get the personnel, discipline, and OPA records. Um, and once we get those and get those carefully reviewed, um, then I think that we'll, they'll be ready. Um, the cases are pretty straightforward and only one seems to be extensive in nature. Um, I also believe that we should maybe propose a date at the end of September or early October to have a special call meeting to address the cases that are ready to move forward. That would give us time to work on our process some more, as well as meet the 10 day posting rule, make the proper notifications and prepare for presentation. And then we also need some time in there um, to get the ITS team to build, you know, to, to actually build our um, web page where these things will be posted according to the information that we um, spoke of in the last PRR meeting a couple of weeks ago or last week. Um, and so that's all I have on the PRR. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Director Fitchard, is there anything that is gonna hold us back from obtaining these uh, personnel reports? No, I don't think so. I think that we've been able to get those and OPA has been helpful with giving us the records, their, their OPA records and discipline records. Um, I don't know exactly, we haven't requested the entire personnel file before. Um, so I think that um, I don't have the answer to that yet until we make that request. But we have been receiving the discipline and OPA records without any type of um, you know, problems. Thank you. Any other questions about the proposed resolution reports? Um, I'm not sure if we should try to schedule a time right now. Ms. Ross? That's what I was uh, thinking. Uh, maybe we can do a uh, do the pool as to a couple of dates. Uh, maybe uh, late September, early October to be ready. 
Thank yes, you, ma'am. That's I was anticipating like maybe the last week of September, but maybe it'll just be better to move for the first week in October or something like that. That would give me plenty of time to work through seven cases and vet them really carefully the way that they need to be. Um, and then, of course, you know, once I receive them and go through them, they may need some changes or other investigative work that we, um, that, you know, that that may be discovered as I'm going through the case. And so, you know, we have seven that are ready for review. That doesn't necessarily mean that seven will be ready at that moment in, you know, the first week of October. Mr. Sweeney. Are we ready to set dates or would it be better to get the feedback from the meeting with Mr. Berg here on Friday first and see if there's any major issues to be addressed? Yeah, I think that we should have our meeting with Mr. Bird first and also like see what the turnaround time is requesting the personnel files and then you know, send out the doodle poll after that, you know, once we get that feedback and I share it with the executive committee and let you guys know what's happening. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Then I guess we look forward to receiving that so we can then uh, work on scheduling that meeting for well, possibly that first week of October, depending on how uh, the meeting with the FOP goes. Um, if there are no more questions on that, I think we can move to new business and announcements. The only um, announcement that I have is that the subpoena, um, I'm sorry, the bill for subpoena process, which is BL 2020 401 passed the second reading on Tuesday, September 1st, and it will move to its third reading on September the 15th. And at the time that it moved um, past its second reading, I think there was 18 council members that had co-sponsored it. Thank you, Director Fitchard. And the third reading is Tuesday, September the 15th, next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So that's an opportunity for us to call our council members if they aren't already co-sponsoring the resolution or ordinance. Um, Ms. Ross? What was the vote? How many council members voted for was it more so, than 18? It was, so it was 18 that co-sponsored it and then it went to the public safety committee. Mm -hmm. And when they did it, they just took a roll call vote. And they took a regular vote and everyone either said yay or nay. there were no nays. So I don't really know how many, you know, what that actual number was, but um, they moved to pass it to the next vote. They did, I don't think they did it. They didn't do an individual vote. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I wanted to hold space for uh, what member Ross just asked. I do think it would be important to know for the full council meeting, and I'm not sure when that happens, but when the, when the, when it does come up to vote from the full council, I think it would be super interesting to know who all voted for nay and who all voted to abstain um, and eyes just to, so we can get a power map of a uh, city council. Okay, I'll be, I'll, yeah, I'll be watching for that. I, so I'm not really sure. Like I know that this is the third re, the third reading, and so I don't know um, if that. I, I'm assuming that will happen on this on the 15th, and you know I'll be watching. The last one, it, it was a long time before they got to it, and I was like, okay, so I wasn't sure. Um, I'm assuming that this is a, the last vote, um, the third, and maybe they will do the whole voting like you're just mentioning. So I'll be I'll be watching for that.
Yeah, I'm on the. Let's see. I'm on the. I keep getting unmuted. Uh, muted. I'm on the MetroClicks website, and they don't have a specific number um, as to a vote. It just says you pass first reading and pass second reading. Um, so we'll look forward to that third reading then. Uh, Ms. Ross? Is it possible to ask the mayor for a roll call vote? Anybody know? I can reach out to um, Council Member Mendez to see uh, if that's possible. I, I'm not sure that maybe the vice mayor would have to make that decision, you think? I'm sorry, yes, I meant the vice mayor. Yeah. We but can... if you reach out to Councilman Mendez, it would be appreciated before you went to the vice mayor. Okay, I can do that. Okay. Any other uh, news or announce, new business or announcements? And I just want to have a reminder that on the 21st of September, um, from 5 to 6.30, we will have our third, we will have our third um, committee, I'm sorry, com community town hall meeting. And I will just follow us on our socials as well as our website. And we'll have that information posted on how to dial in. Um, and so we look forward to community members and those targeted groups or anyone in particular who wants to join in um, to um, to come on board and give us your thoughts. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Director Fitchard. Um, if there is nothing else, I think I can, uh, we can conclude. There's a motion. So move. A second. A second. And I think uh, if we can all just unmute ourselves and say our vote, it's fine. I don't have to do a roll call vote here. Uh, no, there's no need for a roll call vote. You can just. Oh. Your name. Uh, Ms. Ross. Uh, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, and Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. And I vote aye as well. So it's 602, and that concludes the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good Thank evening. You. You too. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.